Hello and welcome back everybody to the Hunt and Hike Harvest podcast. I am Joel Rather once again here in the booth and we have a special guest on today, someone that I met through a mutual friend, our, our buddy Jared from Hunt League. Uh, we were on a panel together a while back judging the outdoorsman of the year, I think it was, and uh, so that was something kind of fun and, and uh, kind of followed up and kept in touch and so we have Tucker Schmidt on today. Tucker, it works for Vortex now. We're going to talk a little bit about his past and kind of how he got to there. But um, Tucker, how are you today? Doing good, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, well, I know you are super busy. We talked quite a bit offline trying to get schedules to meet up. So I appreciate you <laughs> sneaking me in today. And, and uh, I'm excited to, to kind of dig into some stuff because you are an expert in an area that I horrifically suck at so maybe i'm gonna learn some learn some things today so you uh, formerly were a, a sponsored athlete by vortex if i'm correct is that right yep yep yeah and so ton of a wealth of knowledge as far as shooting uh we'll talk about what kinds and types so figure out uh you know kind of what your wheelhouse is and now i'm explaining to people like what do you do now at vortex i know that there's some similarity to that and kind of how you transition there but um tell tell everyone kind of what what you do for vortex yeah so like you said i i was a competitive shooter for a long time you know i kind of did my own thing uh professionally as far as you know renovations i ran a communications company for a long time and uh kind of shot on the side and you know luckily i had enough free time where i can get to the range a lot put a lot of time and many years into it and uh, vortex was actually the first sponsor i ever got so it was pretty cool to to then end up here um shooting mostly pistols uh, you know competition pistols like uspsa or, or even steel challenge a little bit it's like go fast right action shooting that kind of led into three gun a little bit so that's like rifle pistol shotgun action shooting running around trying to be faster and uh you know more accurate than the other guys and i do quite a bit of a long range rifle as well uh and through all of that i was you know shooting four vortexes as well a couple other brands but one day they just had me come up for a visit, a buddy of mine, you know, he was my contact here, a friend, you know, I, I met and shot with him quite a bit all over the country. And, and he just kind of loosely mentioned if I was interested in, in maybe going for a job. And I was, I was pumped, you know, Vortex has kind of built a really cool culture uh, around yeah. just treating people the way you want to be treated, you know, the old way of doing things. And it was something I definitely respected. And I was pumped to have a chance to uh, apply for a gig. Yeah. Uh, even though I had buddies here, you know, it still was like a two and a half, three month process to go through they didn't the interview. Give it to you. Like, oh, he's cool. Bring him on. No, they did. Right, rightfully <laughs> so. Right. That's how you, you control who comes in and stuff like that. So uh, it, it did work out. I did start. And to answer your question, I guess what I do now is I'm attached to dealer sales. So there's many factions of dealer sales. Like there's account managers who actually deal with dealers, sell the product, you know, control shipping of the orders and stuff like that. And then uh, there's mill LE team, which they do the same thing, but for mill LE specifically. And then I'm on a team of six guys. We are the dealer training team. So we will go to a range, whether it's here on site, we have, you know, facilities here, or we'll travel to a, a range of a dealer, whether it's, you know, a Shields or something like that, or if it's just Joe Bob's gun shop, you know, some family owned uh, gig, small town stuff. And we'll just kind of take them to the range and, and really just go shooting with them. Uh, that will involve some classroom time too, but we kind of do things a little different, right? We, you can you know, talk people to death in a classroom forever and they'll retain some of it, right? It does work, sure. but we like to get like hands on, like, let's get you hitting, you know, a thousand, twelve hundred, eighteen hundred yards, uh, with the products. And then you can kind of use that excitement to go back to the retail store and kind of pass that on to the customer with firsthand experience. Uh, and that's not just with our products, right? We're teaching them about scopes in general or binos in general, so they can then, sure. you know, just be a, you know, a master in their, in their field of, of selling sport optics. Yeah, and, and I think from my perspective, someone who, I mean, I grew up hunting most of it, waterfowling, upland bird, things like that. Uh, my dad had grew up in the Dakotas, and he had done some big game hunting, but it, it just never really took to him. So it was something that I didn't really get into until later on. And so yeah. when I moved to Colorado, my first experience in elk hunting was rifle hunting, and I primarily I primarily bow hunt now and Damn, yeah. i think it just has to do more with the time of year and loving september and and all that kind of stuff um but i mean the first probably 10 years that i hunted as far as like rifle goes 
uh, was, was elk hunting here in Colorado. And that was, you know, when I was well into my twenties. And so I feel like for me, one of the things was I've seen, especially with optics and, and the technology and the capability of things now, like it has just escalated so fast in terms of the capabilities of what we see now with glass that, you know, the average consumer can get their hands on. And obviously it's a custom with, uh, you know, some pretty hefty price tags depending upon your yeah. budget. But yeah, uh, some of it also it has to do with why I, you know, don't have a lot of them as well <laughs> because of that. But yeah, you know, talk a little bit about your experiences, you know, with that, because I think the average person, you know, me being one of them, you know, looks at a lot of stuff and is like, holy crap, man, like there's so much to understand with, you know, MOA and all your dialing and windage and, yeah. you know, all these things that you can account for with glass now. Like if you were talking to someone like me, who's like, man, if I just wanted to, you know, something that I can go hunt with something that, you know, is going to be a really good, well-rounded piece. Like where does someone start and how do they like better understand what they're getting into without just looking at it and going like, well, I got this much money, so I'll buy that one. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, that's right. There is a, a million options out there and some work, pretty good for multiple facets, you know, and then some are pretty specific for, you know, X, whatever it is. The cool thing is now like scopes and rifles have gotten so much better. Calibers, rifle calibers have gotten really efficient. I mean, it's, right. it's hard for me to justify and you may get some hate comments for this or not, but like even shooting like a 300 wind mag or a 30, you know, something big magnum hard recoiling. It's hard. Like for me, a seven PRC is like the biggest caliber I have that I shoot honestly. And we'll get into scopes here in a second, but it's more important to be able to shoot with that gun, just like a bow or anything else. Right. If you don't practice with it, you're going to suck at it. That, that's really what it comes down to. And nobody wants to go to the range and shoot a hundred, 150, 200 rounds of 300 wind mag or, or similar, right. you know, 300 run, whatever be 38 anything big i mean usually you shoot about four or five times and it's like this this isn't fun so i always recommend to somebody get a caliber you can shoot you can afford the ammo you can practice with uh six five prc is really hard i mean that's probably my favorite go-to i have a custom rifle and six five prc seven prc uh, and a couple of creedmoors as well but that six five prc really anything in north america if you know how to shoot it should be fine right most yeah. of it is about shot placement uh, I yep. have a buddy out west. He he he's you know part of a huge organization. He killed an elk at 400 with a six arc. I mean, and it didn't go 400 yards. It went maybe 30, which is a pretty good kill shot with any rifle caliber. For sure. As far as scopes go, I mean, there's a wide variety, right? Uh, just in our lineup, obviously, I don't know all of them, but inside of our lineup, you know, the high end like hunting specific scopes we make are LHDs, right? Kind of has everything everything you want nothing you don't it's a super light scope it's a 30 mil tube um the glass in it is is phenomenal right the image quality resolution stuff like that it really is a high-end optic and it, and it comes in at a fairly reasonable price i think you know depending on which one you get four and a half to 22 first focal plane uh that one's going to come in right around 14 1500 bucks and for a you know top-notch hunting optic uh, that's a lot of bang for your buck right and it's you know it's, a, it's sub 30 ounces so it is a light scope you know, less than two pounds. And, uh, you can put that on whatever rifle you want and shoot, you know, anything out to a thousand is pretty good with that scope, right? A common, a common misconception with scopes is they think the tube diameter is d directly related to the amount of light that comes into the scope. I hear yeah. it all the time. That's one of the things we train a lot and really the size of the, the diameter of the scope tube. And I'm talking where the rings go, not the ends is, uh, strictly related to travel in the scope, right? Some, some scopes have, you know, illuminated reticles. They need a little more space. So if they try to jam all that into a 30 mil tube, you're losing a lot of travel. Uh, so really, if you want to shoot far, typically you're going to want a 34 millimeter tube because you get more travel up and down. So that's that's kind of what uh, what that is. And there's a lot of little nuances. I don't want to get in a rabbit hole as far as scope technicalities unless you have those questions. But uh, <laughs> there is something specific for the job. Typically, if I'm going out west or I'm going to be shooting past three 400, which is often... Uh, I'm going to want something with an adjustable parallax on the left-hand side of the scope, and I'm I'm going to shoot first focal plane and mills. Yeah, that's kind of my go-to, man. You know, we you mentioned MOA. That's a, a very common question, which one is better. I don't think either or is necessarily better. I know why I like one better. Uh, mills is kind of the standard for long-range shooters now, uh, mostly tactical shooting, right? TRS, NRL, NRL Hunter, any of that 
sniper competitions, any kind of match shooting, I'd say 95% of people, if not more than that, are all shooting mills. Uh, it's just easier to divide by 10s than it is to divide by 12s or add 12s. Um, and a really cool trick, if you're shooting 6.5 Creedmoor or 6.5 PRC, they both work. And 308 as well, is if you take your target distance, say you're shooting 700 yards, all you have to do is detect two mils from that, and then you have your data. And this is going to work out to about 700 with those three calibers. So if you're shooting 700, deduct two, five mils. So you, you take away two, you're shooting five mils, you're going to be hitting that target within a tenth or two. And that works all the way out to about seven, 800, depending on your rifle setup. So yeah. 450, if you're going to shoot 450, take away two, you dial two and a half, it's going to put you right on target. So it's really hard to argue with that with no calculator, no nothing. And that's the easiest way. That doesn't really work with MOA. So that's one reason, a couple of reasons, actually, yeah. I guess. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's a lot. Like my, I'm like playing catch up with, with a lot of that stuff, you know? And I think it's interesting too, because, you know, in the day and age now that we see with, you know, YouTube and social media, and you, you know, you've got so many now, you know, boutique, as well as, you know, some larger names of people that are building, you know, precision and custom made rifles and those types of things yeah. where, you know, then they're going out and filming and they're watching people shoot, you know, elk and deer at 800, 900, a thousand yards and whatever. And, and I think yeah. there's some novelty to that. And then at the same time where, you know, we talk about being ethical and, and some of those other things, right? Like yeah. from your perspective, you know, when we kind of translate it into, you know, a hunting context, right? Like what do you, number one, like what's your, your, you know, perspective on that? You're a person that probably go like, well, yeah, I could do that. Right. Yeah. And how does a person work towards that? Like what's the, maybe like a, you know, your cliff notes version of that. And, you know, I guess I, I kind of have this weird struggle a lot of times with that when I watch those things where I'm like, um, you know, Sam, Sam, uh, Westfall is a friend of mine as archery in motion. Like he yeah. is, you know, former military and he kind of was like, yeah, I kind of quit, you know, doing a lot of rifle hunting because the last elk I killed was at like 800 yards or something like that. And he was kind of like, I don't feel like I'm, it's hard for me to do that anymore. Cause I'm, you know, he's a proficient shooter and he's like, so I yeah. kind of started bow hunting more, you know, I don't know if that's, if I got a really dialed in question there, but just give us like, no, um, I got you. Your... You see, you kind of asked about like ethical and, and that's a big uh, topic amongst all of the internet, right? Like you shoot a thousand yeah. yards at whatever. That's not cool. Well, it is cool for some people, right? A good rule of thumb <laughs> is don't, don't, don't try to take the longest shot you've ever taken on something that's breathing, right? Like, you know, I shoot that's... 400. I should be able to shoot 600, just aim top of head or, you know, like that's never a good thing. But if, if you're yeah. a guy that can hit, you know, 10, 12 inch plate, you know, nine out of 10 times with your rifle at a thousand, I'd have no problem with you taking a shot at, you know, seven, 800. Like that's not a reasonable, I killed, I mean, I killed an odd dad. I think it was just inside of 800 a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's not unreasonable for a lot of people to do that. Uh, you just really have to spend the time with your weapon system, you know, to, yeah. to be confident. You don't want to just be flinging lead, you know, hitting things in the legs and then, you know, that's not cool. I, you know, I am a, it, it's funny. A lot of us who hunt, a lot of people don't realize like most of us love animals, you know, of some sort, whether it's right. dogs, cats, farm animals, we all care about conservation. Like we are the supporters yeah of the, you know, the conservation movement, you know, like a lot of people don't understand that sure. you don't hunt. Uh, so we don't want to be maiming and injuring uh, anything. So if you're going to take a shot at 400, make sure you're good out to six or 700. Uh, and that really just takes a little time. The, the cool thing is you mentioned YouTube, right? The cool thing about YouTube is it's really armed people with a lot of information, right? It's kind of exploded the hunting world, shooting world, golf. I mean, you whatever right like during right, covid everything. people couldn't do things in groups so hunting like exploded like golf courses filled up i mean which is great the problem is everybody thinks because they saw this guy do it on youtube now they can do it right and that's that's oh, not yeah. always the case i would say yeah. if you can you know if you shoot comfortable at 700 i'd say it's very easy to shoot 500 in on, a, on an animal right honestly like it's a pretty big target especially on an elk as you mentioned but you're right talking about your buddy and 
kind of how he feels. Like I typically archery hunt more. Am I going to say no to go, you know, shoot antelope or elk with a rifle? No, I'll go do that too. But there's just something cool about bow hunting, man. Like you're out there, it's quiet. You've got this, obviously the bows are pretty fancy now, but it's an old school way of doing things way before gunpowder was around and it's just quiet. Plus you have to get really close and there's definitely more of a challenge to it. So I love bow hunting, man. I have, you know, six or seven bows and I do love bow hunting more than, more than, more than rifle, but I will definitely go hunt things with rifles too. You know, both are good. I hope, I hope I answered some of your questions there. I kind of got, this this is good. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, my next question is like bringing up, talking about bow hunting for you. When, like, did you, have you always bow hunted as well or, Was bow hunting a progression for you? I mean, it was a little bit of a progression for me. I mean, I've bow hunted for, you know, probably 20 years now. I mean, I didn't grow up, you know, sitting in tree stands. I grew up kind of in Nebraska where, you know, everybody's whitetail and mule deer hunting and things like that. But more of it was, you know, my dad didn't really do it. So I bird hunted more. And then one of my good friends, his, his dad grew up on the South gate of Yellowstone. And so elk hunting, moose hunting, all that stuff was just kind of a way of life. And I kind of listen to stories forever. And I've talked about this in previous podcasts where I'm like, you know, sitting around at, at, you know, a Friday night and and having a beer with him and listening to them tell stories. I'm like, how do I get to go on one of those trips? You know? And like, that's how I kind (laughs) of got, got my way into hunting, which was now, you know, a long time ago. And then, as I mentioned, then I kind of started progressing into bow hunting. Like what was your kind of progression of that? And then my follow up to that is how do you, how does, what you know from your shooting side more on the the firearm side how do you kind of view that as as like how you are as a bow hunter in terms of shot process and you know all those things in terms of proficiency because i think there's a there's obviously a crossover to that stuff i'd just be interested to hear your perspective yeah i think anything where you fling a projectile right with a trigger of some sort and some sort of mechanism that uses ballistics to then hit the target i think there is going to be some crossover right you're always going to have fundamentals you have to learn to touch on your question though like i didn't grow up hunting at all man i grew up in florida my dad you know he's a decent enough guy never super involved hardcore liberal no guns no hunting none of that uh so when i turned 18 i went right away and bought like a shotgun was like the first thing just because i could and i didn't need any permission you know and, uh, <laughs> like and uh, i would just drive down with this piece of crap shotgun to like a sporting clay place just by myself man i was just always interested in it and i'd you know shoot the clays and uh, that was kind of my first introduction then of course when you turn 21 you can start buying pistols and stuff like that uh so i was just a competition guy for a long time uh then you know i met some people in florida where you know i'll go go shoot some pigs or maybe bird hunting a little bit, but it really wasn't until I moved to Wisconsin until I started like big game hunting and, you know, being here pretty fortunate to meet some, some people who know what they're doing and, you know, maybe go on some cool trips. So it was funny because the first year I was hunting started with the rifle because that's kind of what I knew. By, by then I had already got a bow and I had shot bow, you know, off and on a few times, never like had a bow set up for me or my own stuff. Uh, so right. I got one right when I moved here from a buddy of mine and I uh, started shooting with that a little bit. But I mean, I killed Havelina, uh, Audad, a couple deer, all kinds of stuff that first year. I was like, this hunting stuff is great. You know, not, <laughs> not, not realizing how lucky I was to be able to go on some of these. You know? Right. And then I, and then, you know, bow season kind of, halfway midway through until it gets to the October, November, everybody's like, all right. And I've been shooting bows the whole time, you know, a lot, uh, ended up buying a brand new bow, like five months in after the one I had traded my buddy for and kind of had it built for me and started building arrows. I'm just kind of, I don't know. I'm kind of a, a junkie for that stuff. You know what, whether it's rifles, like I jump in full time. Okay. I have to have a, a barrel vice and I have to be able to put my guns together and the same thing with bows. So it's funny now I've, probably been shooting a bow like full time for like about four years. I mean, I have a bunch of bows, a bow, I have a full shop in my basement. So now all these people that have been bow hunting way longer than me come over and we work on their bows and get them tuned and put their strings on. So it's just kind of funny. But to answer your question, like the crossover was really quick, right? Like once I learned how like the peep sight and the the sight itself kind of worked in use and it was pretty easy to then kind of hold it stable and, and, you know, break good shots, the form and stuff like that took, took at least a year, I think, to get proficient to where I could hit, you know, quarters of 20 and, and kind of go that route. But I do believe there's a lot of crossover between the two. 
Yeah, I've I've seen especially like I have friends that you know have previous military experience. A buddy of mine that he was a former like Marine sniper and um, somebody actually probably somebody that you know, um, Neil Davies from Hornady. Oh yeah, um, I know Neil. Yeah, yeah. So I went to high school with Neil. Oh nice. Yeah, you guys so, are Nebraska boys, right? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we went to high school together. We still I've had him on the podcast before, and but. It, I've watched guys like that. Like I was at Ta uh, Total Archery Challenge yep. la last year, and my buddy, who was a former Marine sniper, like he came and he was kind of early into bow hunting, like probably you know two, three years or whatever. And we go out and we start shooting, and like I just would watch him, and I'm like, holy cow! Like I could see his process and how quickly he yeah. translated it into shooting a bow, and like we went through the whole day, and of course, like. I don't claim to be, you know, a great shot or proficient or, you know, anything like that. I mean, I shoot as much as I can. This year has been horrific in terms of that, just based on my schedule. But yeah, like just watching him, I was like, holy cow, man. Like he, he was just dialed like all day. It didn't matter the distance, yeah. nothing never changed, you know? And, you know, so you could definitely see that. And so that's why I assumed it was probably similar for you where, you know, when you have so much time on the trigger and you spent so much time really honing that, that, you know, when you switch from one to the other, it's pretty easy to kind of maintain consistency in like how you get to that shot, right? Like you said. I, uh, kind of a big part of that, and you mentioned it was like shot process, right? Like your average bow hunter, at least around here, right? They've kind of grown up with it, you know, typically like Midwestern guys, right? They go out, they, they pull their bow out, you know, two weeks before the season, make sure the strings are in one piece. And then they, they take a shot or two to like, yep, it's good. And then they'll go shoot Still deer works. and, uh, that's just not how I operate, right? Like I want to make sure every knock is tuned. The veins are perfect. Like every arrow weighs within a grain. Like I'm a psych. It's just like if I'm reloading ammo to, to shoot, you know, whatever, once in a lifetime, whatever. Same with a bow, right? Like the, the level of precision kind of transferred over for me from like the ammo side to the, to the arrow side. And as right. soon as I got a bow, it's like, well, let's see if we can shoot 140 with this thing. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, that way, yeah, if yeah. you're taking a shot at 40 or 50, like it, it's no big deal. Um, same concept kind of like we talked about with the rifle, but really having that shot process when it comes time to shoot, you know, training in the off season, when it comes time to, to take that shot on the animal, it should be the easiest shot you've taken because you've prepared for it. You've got your shot pressed down, your, your process down and, uh, you're going to have some anxiety when it comes time to break that shot. Right. So the, for sure. the thing, the thing you don't want to be thinking about is like, Oh my God, where's my thumb go? Like, am I doing this right? Open my hand, you know, make sure yeah, yeah. level like that should all be automatic. I mean, a muscle memory at that point. So having a good shot process down, no matter what you're shooting, I think is, is critical. Yeah. And, and I, I like, I can recall almost like, as you were saying that, like in my head, almost seeing myself like i can completely remember the first time i drew my bow on an elk and i remember like thinking to myself yeah i was doing that number <laughs> and i realized as i'm like looking at the elk like i have not even remotely found the target through my peep yet i'm right. just like and i'm just like holy cow like get get it together you know a lot and, of emotion happening oh for sure right and uh, so like i i totally understand that and i think you know, just like with everything else, like even just being in those situations, right? You know, I think it's easy for people to to watch YouTube and stuff like that, as we talked about, and you just see guys like, oh, like here he comes, and they just draw back and settle and let it rip, you know, and and that's that's a lot of times being in that situation for it to, to look that easy, right? A hundred percent. And uh, yeah, bow hunting is just different, man. When you're that close to an animal and you're trying to be quiet, whether you're in a tree or behind it, behind something, you know, on the ground. Uh, you're going to feel it. And that was, you know, probably why I got so addicted to it. Cause I mean, rifle hunting, you have time. Typically you have time to sit there, calm down. Okay. My dope's good. Check the wind, get my data. Like you're further away. A bow, yeah. I mean, it can happen in a couple seconds, you know, and you can blow it even less in less time than that. So you really yeah. have to be, <laughs> you really have to be good. And, uh, you know, that first year when I was out hunting, I was just hunting public land here. Yeah. 
and I had a saddle, you know, a lightweight kit. I'd go out by myself. I think I sat 30 something days before I finally saw a deer at all. Cause you know, I'm learning yeah. like what I'm doing. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, when I did, I was freaking shaking in my boots, man, my knees. And it was just, just a doe, right? Like first, first big aim animal oh, yeah. I've ever killed. So yeah, I kind of sneak behind the tree, draw back. And when I get on the deer, uh, I mean, my legs are just quaking. Needless to say, I did shoot the doe, but I, I mean, right then I was like hooked on bow hunting, man. Yeah. It was a really cool experience to go through. For sure. I've just loved it ever since. Yeah. Well, the, the one area, like, you know, I've talked about, you know, especially from a firearm side of things, right. Which is, you know, I, I don't shoot rifle a ton and some of it is just, you know, that I bow hunt more than I do the other yeah. into the range, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I'd, I'd love to do it more. Um, I travel too dang much and, and I'm not unfortunately capable of going out in my backyard or, you know, where I used yeah, to be where a, it's like super simple thing, to yeah. be able to actually, you know, get rounds down. But the one thing that I found that maybe I'm even potentially worse, I make my sound like I'm just like a horrible freaking marksman, but is when I started getting into handguns and I realized like that is a whole different animal, uh, you know, especially when yeah. you're trying to learn what you're used to where, you know, you've got this length in, you know, a barrel and, and steadiness and all this other stuff. And last year's last year, the year before, uh, we did a bunch of work for Mantis. Uh, I'm sure yeah. you're probably familiar with them. Yeah. It's like the dry and, fire training system kind of thing, right? Yeah, the dry fire and their their X ten X Elite and that you can use live rounds with and things like that, where it's giving you so much feedback, virtual coach thing. Maybe we'll touch right. on that and get your opinion of that. But that was probably the most opportunity I got to, you know, just get lots of trigger pulls and learn so much more about that. Like how, how was your kind of experience? I know you mentioned like, ah, as soon as I could buy a handgun, I started shooting yeah. and you see how talk about time and learning for, for, from a precision standpoint to be really good there, three gun and things like that. Or like you talked about, like moving as, as you see, as, you know, in some of the competitions where you're going from target to target and being able to acquire them and be, be accurate. What, what was your process other than just shooting tons and tons and tons of that? Like, were you coach taught or how, how did you kind of get to where like you were yeah good in, in terms of, of a handgun yeah so a couple things there right like you mentioned like your pistol was like a whole different animal the biggest thing is with, with a rifle right you have three points of contact you got your trigger hand you got your shoulder and then you have your your support hand uh, left yeah. or right depending on which way you shoot but it is i can take somebody who's never shot before sit them on a bench with a bipod in a bag give them the data tell them the wind or dial it in and they can hit a thousand yards within two or three shots right uh, believe it or not, the hardest thing is just to get new people to be able to look through a scope. It's something you forget about as, you know, a right. mid to advanced shooter, right? You don't even think about it. That's just what you do. But when you're new, you see people kind of ducking their head, moving their head around. And uh, it's the little things you take advantage of. It's going to sound kind of cliche, but when you're shooting a pistol, it is all about, uh, when you're learning to shoot, all about the fundamentals. Uh, nowadays, it's kind of cool because the the pistol world has kind of changed with the influx of red dots. It doesn't have to be a vortex dot, any kind of red dot. If you're going to buy a pistol and you want to learn to shoot a handgun, buy a red dot when you buy the pistol. Buy a pistol that you can mount a red dot to. Reason being because it takes this three-plane aiming system away and then you can just focus on the fundamentals of gripping the pistol. The grip is, is everything. Yeah. The, uh, the, the argument that you hear for people against red dots is, well, it's electronic. You, you can't trust it. You can't trust your life on it. Well, there's a reason cops and FBI agents and contractors and everybody has red dots now, right? The truth yep. is, worst case scenario, the red dot doesn't turn on or your glass is completely broken out, which will almost never happen, at least with ours. Uh, and most other major manufacturers, uh, you can center that target if your grip is good inside of the frame of that dot. And I can put 50 out of 50 on target in you know, a softball or so size group at the seven to eight yards. And I believe the average self-defense shooting is, you know, what, three to five yards. So if you're ever in that situation, your dot's off, worst case scenario, your fundamentals are good. You should be able to center up whatever the target is uh, inside of that frame. But red dots as a whole, not just Vortex, I'm talking all of them, have gotten way better. I'm not talking about the $30 Amazon special red dot, right? <laughs> I'm talking about any quality major manufacturer, you know, Vortex, Leopold, Holosun, whoever, Trigicon. Um, 
they are very robust now. So when Red Dots, ours included, kind of came out, they were cool. They were kind of like a novelty. You could put them on a pistol, but none of them were really meant to handle the round count that people were putting on them. Uh, the funny thing is competition really drives the market, right? So competitive guys started using red dots. None of them would last, ours included. You might get 10 rounds, you might get a couple thousand, but they all broke. Um, now the market has kind of caught up to the demand um, and the red dots are very, very good. They're, now they're focusing on like true zero parallax red dots and the glass is getting clearer. The battery life is getting longer. The biggest argument you hear is like, well, I want to I wanna learn with iron sights and then maybe I'll get a red dot. In theory, it needs to go the other way around. Uh, you mentioned like being able to see and transition quickly between targets. A good shooter, you can't tell the difference between two shots on one target or two shots on two different targets as long as they're a reasonable distance apart. Uh, the reason being is your eyes are a muscle. You have to train them to see quickly. How do you yeah. do that? You do it a lot, right? You let your lies lead the gun with a red dot or without. You always want to lead, just like if you're pointing at people, I'm not going to point at this guy and then follow my finger over to this guy and point. I'm going to lead with my eyes and uh, always lead the gun. If your grip and fundamentals are correct, the gun should go right to where you're looking. But right. you cannot, cannot, especially in the early days, spend enough time getting a correct grip. Two hands on the gun in a correct position. A big one we see a lot of the times is, you know, a guy grips the gun with his firing hand, the thumb goes down, and then the support hand goes right over top of that thumb. And then the support hand uh, isn't really on the gun. So you're losing all that recoil control. The speed really comes down to controlling recoil. And you, you asked if, if I had taken classes. I definitely have. It's funny, you know, over the years, I've kind of met most of the people who, who do like Steve Anderson or, or, you know, Ben Stoger and a lot of these guys. I know kind of personally and uh, even now, like, I mean, I've shot, I don't know, a couple million rounds with a handgun in the last 10 years or so. And I'll still go take a class. And it was funny, Ben Stoger was just here doing like a Vortex class for some of the edge guys and a few other employees that wanted to, you know, take the class. And I'd still take things away. So like never stop learning. Uh, yeah. But there is no substitute for just getting out and, and shooting whatever it is you want to get better at. Um, yeah, but pistol is by far the hardest thing to shoot, man. As far as, as far as, you know, firearms go, you got to keep it in your hands. But once you get that grip down, that learning curve goes way up. And, you know, if you yeah. want to be fast, you got to shoot fast. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, that, that was the thing I think for me is we did reviews on Mantis, like their laser Academy, their X10 elite. Um, we actually did their new, uh, their Blackbeard system, which is for their AR platform um, that has a trigger reset on it. And, you know, I think as I went through that where, you know, we, we were filming stuff as far as like all the functionality and, and then within that, you know, I think I put probably just in, in that process of putting those together. I know, I, I think I had over a thousand trigger pulls when we did that and yeah. it was amazing to me which is using the system itself, the feedback that it would give you, like you talked about in terms of grip and trigger pull and support hand and all those things. Like it was pretty intuitive to give you kind of like what your flaws are, like as you were doing that stuff, which of course, um, I, I just did a podcast with my buddy from Uller's Archery and I was talking about how like, I, I liken the shooting world, whether it's a bow, a handgun, whatever, to golf, where it's like people always will be like, Hey, have you tried this? Like, uh, maybe, maybe think about this. Like, uh, wh what are you thinking before you do this? And like, how are you like approaching this? And like, everybody has like an opinion about, you know, the yeah. proper way to like, some, you know, some good, some bad. Yeah, and exactly. A hundred percent. Right. And, and yet it's always one of those things too, where there's perfection is like unattainable. Yeah. I mean, like no matter what, and no matter how many times, you know, you've been behind any type of, like you said, something that that's going to throw a projectile down range. Right. Like you can, you, you know, you mentioned like a, you know, a million rounds or whatever. I'm like, I'm sure you could probably still go like, man, I should, I need to work on this. And like, I know when I do this, it doesn't, my result isn't as good or whatever. And it's yeah. like, it's a constant thing. And, and, um, you know, I think a lot of people lose sight of, of the fact that it's easy to get into traps when you watch other people do stuff and you're like, Oh, well that should be easy. Right. And I, and I think even the most proficient people will tell you like, they still have to work really hard at it to keep a level of, you know, what their competent or proficiency looks like. Yeah. So I'm going to uh handgun nationals in Alabama here in I don't know, three or four weeks or so. And 
you know, I haven't been shooting as many matches uh, this year because of the house and like all the things I've been doing. So I was actually down there shooting during lunch, uh, just put up a little stage and I try to shoot it. Like I'm still going to be good at shooting. Am I going to be good enough to play some 95th percent or better? Probably not because I haven't, you know, your level is going to be whatever it is for you, right? Like, so if you shot that thousand rounds and then didn't go out for another year, when you come back, do you think you're going to be as good as you were right after you finish? You're not, um, there just is no substitute for good practice. The cool thing about firearms, right? A lot of it you can do at your house with no ammo as far as like the muscle memory you're trying to build, right? Like getting your gun out of the holster with something like Mantis or any of the other dry fire trainers out there. Sure. Just dry firing, reloading, drawing to first shot, breaking good trigger squeezes. You can do a lot of that without ammo. Obviously, yeah. you still have to live fire, right? Like you got to get used to that recoil and, and really yeah. training your eyes to transition quickly between targets uh, is really how we you know, save time in the shooting world when we're speed shooting, right? It's funny because a lot of tactical guys are like, oh, you know, that stuff will get you killed in the streets, but I guarantee you in a gunfight, the fastest guy is still going to win, right? Yeah, especially if they can put it on target, right? That's, yeah. that's, that's really it. Uh, you know, we, we train people a lot. That's kind of most of our full-time job. 75% um, of the time we're on the range with somebody, and, you know, people always ask, like, oh, I, I don't do this. You know, I'm a tactical shooter. I'm like, okay, well, that's cool, but really when you're shooting, you're, you're learning to shoot or you're learning tactics. When you do it all correctly, right, you put those two things together. But you take a USBSA or any type of fast shooting pistol guy and teach him basic tactics and fundamentals going through a house or whatever the case may be, that guy's going to outshoot any cop or special warfare guy um, there is just because he's trained in that speed training. So it's cool when a lot of those, you know, the, the guys that, you know, professionals that, that use firearms professionally, uh, military or otherwise, it's cool when they kind of get into that competition setting. They're like, holy crap, like these people are incredible and I want to do this. So I get better at my job. Yeah. So it's cool to see that. Yeah. Well, I know like when, um, when we did that, uh, that Blackbeard uh, had a guy that I knew who was in uh, special forces. Um, and I said, you know, I won't do a whole lot of justice to this thing. If you want to film me like, you know, hammering away here and, and trying to, you know, do this, this thing justice. I'm like, Hey, would you want to come and run through this thing? Like, I'd love to get your opinion because you're a very proficient shooter. You spend, you know, countless hours on the range and, and obviously you talked about like the tactics portion. Yeah. That's the livelihood. Right. And, and I'll never forget. So what I did was like our building where I'm in right now, it's two stories. It's like almost 12,000 square feet. I was like, you know, what'd be cool is I, I'd like you to go through the building. Like you're clearing it. Yeah. And so I filmed him and just followed him around clearing. And I had targets set up in like various places and, you know, you talked about movement and your eyes and how your eyes are controlled by muscles. Like we do so much in terms of training and by training, I mean, like on the physical side in, in my right. world where you're a hundred percent right. And we do a, a ton of, of eye movement stuff, tracking quadrant work, all these things to try and improve like visual acuity. And yeah. when I was filming him, like he, he would come around a corner and I saw like how quickly he could acquire target. And then he put eight trigger pulls on that target that were just center mass, like bam, 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 bam. And I was yeah. just like, my gosh. Right. Like, yeah. And you know, it wasn't, it wasn't distance. It was just like being able to find it that fast. And then immediately I drive, boom, get on target. And he just like hammer time. And you could see that laser just, you know, boom, 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 boom. And I, and I remember, you know, of course I was just kind of thinking to myself like, well, that's pretty good, I think. Like, holy crap! And yeah, then... we have a uh, we had a guy on our team uh, that he was a SEAL for a long time, and you know he was a sniper instructor. But obviously, he went through all the stuff. Very good at clearing houses, and uh, I feel like I'm a pretty good shooter. I do not come from the tactical side at all. Obviously, I've been in those trainings, and I've been through a few of them. And uh, two of us went into the building. And uh, the other two, my buddy and then the guest, uh, were to come clear us, so to speak. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to freaking kill this guy. You know, is what I was thinking. And uh, 
Dude, he's on another level, man. He lit me up with so many freaking airsoft BBs. It was bad. And uh, I remember a story when, when they were talking about it afterwards. He, My buddy was leading, and the guest, the guy that was visiting here, was uh, following him. And my buddy was like, he's like, close your mouth. And he's like, what? He's like, your footsteps. I can hear him out of your mouth. He's like, there's just, there's, there's levels to this stuff, man. And uh, it was uh, just because you can shoot good doesn't mean you're ready to go clear a house. Like that stuff is <laughs> in real life. It is scary. It is dangerous. And split seconds determine whether you live or die. And, you know, yep. yeah. thank God there's people out there that do that stuff. And uh, for sure, but those guys, you know, the special warfare level of folks doesn't matter if it's army, navy, whatever. Like those dudes train a lot because they have to, right? They got to protect oh, yeah. themselves and their partners. And uh, yep. So it's it's cool to get the experience that once in a while. But yeah, I had a lot of welts, and I had a lot of welts <laughs> that day. I got a couple shots off and hit a couple targets, but I, I had way more than I gave. I promise. That, yeah, I, I should have been probably a, a fun experience. Maybe like you said, probably a little humbling, you know, where you're like. Yeah, this will be good. I'm ready, right? And then you find out. Yeah, there's always, uh, there's always. Seems like there's always, no matter where you're at, there's always another level, right? And then That's someone, for sure. Someone else is at, and I'm, I'm fortunate. I, I've been in and around a, a lot of that, and just based on things I do in terms of education on my side of the fence, and yeah, and a ton of stories I could probably share with you, maybe more offline that probably shouldn't be shared online, but um, <laughs> that are that are pretty pretty amazing about some experiences and things that I've I've been around, which is cool too. So, um, well, you know, you mentioned I heard you mention Audad. I know you've been out here. Here and, and elk hunted. I'm, I'm bummed. We we were actually we were yeah. planning to ha have you uh, and the the fiance come out next month, and and you guys kind of got a little bogged down with a lot of stuff you got going on. So, but talk about hunts. Maybe favorite hunt you've done and the hunt that's that's on your bucket list. Like what what's what's at the pinnacle for you? Well, like I said, we were both uh, super bummed not to make it out there we did get a new place we've been doing lots of projects out there we're getting married in october and uh this elk hunt like butted right up against the back side of that so if i was gone for 12 days come back to work for like two days and then gone for three weeks or two weeks it was uh it just seemed to be getting more and more unrealistic but uh so yeah the last couple of years i've been out with jared our buddy from uh from hunt league to to hunt and the first year it's me and jared and, and jared is a a freaking mountain goat dude he, that dude is hard to keep up with oh, yeah. uh, at altitude and and he will make you earn it all the time oh yeah and, uh, you know i'm flatlander here we're you know a thousand <laughs> feet up or so so it was funny uh oh it's just you know it's just me so i flew out met jared he picked me up from the airport at i don't know seven six or seven we got to the mountains at like midnight set up a you know camp and, and slept and then at like four in the morning he's like all right let's go so straight up to the top of the mountain, I think it was around 9,000 feet, if I'm guessing, and halfway up that yep. thing, I'm like, <laughs> so, so the next year I was like, Jerry, we, we got to gotta let me hang out here for a night or two before we go right to the top of a mountain. Right, right. You know, I, I don't live here. So, so I did. So the next year, we didn't get anything that year. Saw a bunch. Uh, couldn't get to any had a couple close calls needless to say we didn't we didn't harvest one that year. And uh, so next year, which is last year, I came out. I, the problem is elk hunting is always right around open nationals, which is the vision I shoot the most. That's like my prime division for pistols. So I shot open nationals, had all my stuff packed, flew from Alabama uh, to Wisconsin, dumped my shooting gear, grabbed all my hunting gear, flew out to Colorado, got there. You know, I, I, I think I slept for an hour or two uh, before the switch. And so I get out there and, and Jared and his, I think it's his brother-in-law or cousin, Micah, uh, was going hunting, bro, new hunter. Brother. Yeah. Okay. His brother. And yeah. uh, I think he's a newer hunter also. Yeah. And uh, so we get to a hotel about an hour, maybe 45 minutes or so away from where we're going to hunt and camp and everything uh, at the hotel. So they left. I'm like, guys, just go. If you want to go scout a little bit or something cool, I'm going to crash. I've had an hour of sleep and we'll, we'll crush it in the morning. And so I go to bed and I wake up and I saw a text at like 8 p.m. It's like, oh, we freaking got one. And I was like, you got to be me. <laughs> they went out there. I think he blew a couple calls and this elk came, a bull elk. I think he was a pretty good size five by five. Was this came last in year? About to last year, yep. Yo, yeah, I saw came the in video. Yeah, you probably saw it. Came into about 20, 25 yards and Micah shot. Uh, I think that was his first shot ever on an elk. So it wasn't the best of shots. Uh, they backed out. 
you know, we all, I woke up the morning like, did you guys freaking get an elk? Like, am I just coming to pack out? What's the deal? And uh, they're like, well, we gotta, we gotta go look for it. So we did. And, uh, we looked and looked, didn't find any blood, didn't find an arrow. We're like, did he miss? Watch the video. Couldn't really tell. So we looked for a couple days and then we started hunting. And then I think it was going into that third day. Jared noticed like a, you know, a little swarm of crows off in the distance. And he's like, we got to go look at that. That might be your elk. And sure enough, it was probably half a mile to a mile away from where they had shot. He did have a shot on the elk far back in the guts and a massive bear was yeah. sitting over the carcass. I mean, the biggest, the biggest I think Jared ever said seen. that's, yeah, Jared said like, that's the biggest black bear he had seen. He lives there. And uh, I still have pictures of that thing. And uh, so we ended up obviously not being able to harvest the animal. He obviously got the head. It was a you know horrible experience. I guess that's part of hunting, but. Yeah. That's why it's so important to be proficient with whatever it is you're shooting, right? Yeah, for sure. So far, I haven't really been in that situation where I've shot something and injured it and hurt it and not found it or not be able to harvest it. But I know it's going to happen. It does happen. Yeah, I've been there. So far, so good. But I don't know. I think a favorite hunt was probably that Audad, man. I mean, I've shot a lot of whitetail here over the last few years. And I, and I and the first one's just as exciting as the last. And uh but the odd dad was just because it was very different. You know, it was really a, a different thing. And they're a weird looking animal. And it was a long shot. And I, I shot twice. Both were good hits uh, on target a, a long ways away. I think it was 780 or 750 or, or something like that. And uh, Yeah. But that was out in South Texas, Marfa, just outside of Marfa, Texas. But that, that was yeah. really cool. But I'm hoping to get an elk that I get to harvest one of these times. Um, yeah. Last year, we got really close. I mean, Jared and I found a herd bull, you know, I don't know, maybe a week into that hunting trip. And it was way up the hill. It was getting dark. And, uh, I mean, I ended up, you know, Jared is like a master caller, at least to me. I don't know if he is in, amongst the... He's, yeah, he's good. He's good. Amongst the world's best. But, I mean, to me, he sounds like a freaking elk, and he is good at it. And uh, so he stayed back and was calling, and I just ran like a mile straight up this hill through the swamp and then up the hill. Uh, and got pretty close to that thing. I'd, I'd probably say within a hundred yards or so, but it was just dark. By the time I got up there, I couldn't see anything. And so still yeah. have not got one with the bow. Yeah. It's, uh, well, it, you know, when you look at the percentages, I, I mean, it's low, it's low. Right. And, uh, yeah. and yet at the same time, I mean, I, I know guys, you know, like Joe Gillia, a buddy of mine from Elk Bros. He's, you know, hunted elk and been a guide down in New Mexico for over 30 years. And he's like, dang, he's like, I've killed an elk 35 years in a row, you know? And I'm just like, that's Holy crazy. crap. And, yeah. you know, so there, there are people that obviously are on the other side of that. And I know quite a few people yeah. that, you know, do have higher success rates than that. But, but yeah, it, it's super hard, you know? And, and we've had years where we've hunted areas where, it was hundred percent dependent upon like how the year's been in terms of precipitation, water yeah. sources, all that stuff where, I mean, I've been on elk hunts for seven to 10 days that, you know, just seem like freaking camping trips, you know? And yeah, I've had, I've had other days where or other trips where I've been in that same place that, you know, I've hunted a similar area numerous times, five, six, seven times or whatever, where I've been out in the morning in this, this one spot that we go into and heard, 50 bugles in a morning that's a good and morning it is a good morning uh, but it doesn't mean that you automatically fill tags either and no no i consider myself to be one of the best bow hikers out there dude i can bow hike with the best of them i'm telling you there's a club we, we keep talking about like i've got i've got this this is like the full draw uh yeah. shirt on here i tell keep telling Jason, who he does all of our design work and logo stuff or whatever. I'm like, dude, we, we just need to make like one of those shirts that says like professional bow hikers or like bow hikers and not anonymous or something like that. Or I'm yeah. like, you know, here's a hot, group hot for that. Line. Yeah, that's about right. We're a little so. spoiled here for whitetail. I mean, if you, if you put in a few, you know, the hours, you're, you're probably going to get a deer. I think me and the, the old lady shot, I don't know, five or six last year. Uh, and we didn't hunt a whole lot. You know, I like eating venison. I like eating elk. Like, that's really why I do it. I know a lot yeah. of people just, 
they, you know, they chase the biggest thing out there and that's great. Like if, if that's what you're into uh, yeah. and you've, you've probably killed a lot of things like your, you know, your buddy for 35 years, he's probably chasing the biggest thing he can find. Cause he's, he's done it all. Yeah. Uh, for me, man, I just want a good size, whatever it is I'm hunting and be able to, you know, eat on it throughout the year. For sure. I mean, that's, you couldn't be more speaking to my heart because I'm even of the, you know, the mindset where, you know, people are like, Oh, what do you like to hunt this and that? And I'm like, I've never even spent a ton of time deer hunting. I've been on lots of deer hunts. Yeah. But if I have to choose, you know, never been on antelope hunt in my life because I don't like antelope. I've never liked. Oh my gosh, that is a you know. It's I'm sorry to cut you off. But no, you're my good. My lady went last year to New Mexico and shot an antelope first one, and it was just a massive uh, antelope. And uh, dude, that thing was fantastic. So is it really, really like based on their geographical location? Because man, those tendies, like the back straps on that thing, yeah. were just so tender and so pure a flavor. Like it was phenomenal. And I've heard a lot of people say they don't like them. So I wonder if it's. You know, I think, kind of like yeah. deer, right? Where they're at, what they're eating kind of thing. Some of that. I did have a good friend of mine, Dylan. He is with Kuchar Valley Archery down south here. He made some antelope for us a couple of years ago that was actually pretty good. And I was like, wow, that's actually really good. You know, I'll always try it. But I just yeah. have never had enough antelope where like most of my experiences that I've had, I'm kind of like, eh, I don't know. It's not great. I've heard that a lot. Yeah. Most of what I, you know, people that I know that hunt them, a lot of always said like, you need to talk about shot placement, proficiency, whatever, put them down because if they yeah. run, it's worse. Like they're gone. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then Chance, who is kind of in that same pool of people and who's with God's country guide, whatever he's like, he, as soon as they're, they're down, you need to, you need to get them clean and you need to get them on ice as fast as possible because yeah, if they, you that, let them that's what they did. All, yeah. Um, so I think maybe that's it too. And it's not to say that I wouldn't go antelope hunting or that I, you know, wouldn't like to at some point, but, um, you know, kind of back to my point, it's like, I mean, that's, that's why I love elk hunting. It's like, I love elk meat. Like it's, it's something good. for me where it's like, I've had plenty of deer and stuff like that. I like deer, but like, if you're going to give me my choice and be like, well, this is the only thing you get. I'm like, that's my go-to elk, and elk or moose. <laughs> you do a lot of, you eat a lot of moose or you try, I'm guessing you have probably. Moose is, I mean, yeah, it's just, you just can't hunt them enough, you know, like to get know, them to the that's the tough part. I mean, I had a friend two years ago, he drew a elk tag in Wyoming in a draw unit. They had like 16, 17 or however their preference points go. He that's drew, crazy. he drew, uh, or no, it's the opposite. He drew a moose tag in Wyoming. And then he drew, he had 24 points in Colorado for elk. So he, he shot a 380 inch elk. Oh my God. It was a 30 minute hunt in like one of the, one of the two or three, like the most prime, you know, units in Colorado shot it in like 30 minutes. He shot his moose in Wyoming that year. And the year before that, he drew, uh, the trophy unit in Nevada for mule deer. He shot a 200 and wow. 210 or 212 inch mule deer in Nevada. And so he yeah. gave us some of his moose and like, oh my gosh, man, if you so could, good. if you could eat moose more often, I'd be too, I'd be all in on that. <laughs> yeah. You, you mentioned a good point of that, right? Like this guy that had 24 or 16 points and, and, you know, with the boom in the hunting world, like it is really getting hard to get tags yeah. Like your state, Colorado. They just, after this year, they're ditching over the counter archery, which to me is just bananas. You'd think they'd do that with rifle rather than archery, but yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be getting really hard and really expensive to hunt places you don't live. Uh, yeah. That's kind of a bummer. I, I'm interested to see how that's going to pan out. You know, like I know yeah. obviously like a lot of my friends and, and, you know, folks like yourself that uh, have just relied heavily on being able to come to Colorado and go elk hunting. And, and to be honest right. with you, you know, like I, I've lived here for over 20 years and, you know, I'm not one of those guys like, like freaking out of staters and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. You know, I like the availability of people being able to experience coming out here. Is there good and bad? There's good and bad and everything. And you sure There's I run into, yeah. you know, I've ran into people where I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this clown doing? You know, or, or someone, <laughs> yeah, that, you yeah, know, there's a lot of that, you know, that, that, yeah. that's, you know, disrespectful or whatever, doesn't understand, you know, basic, you know, ethics and other people being in areas and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like, you know, I don't know how they're going to go about it. I, you know, like I told my buddy, I'm like, 
that may mean nothing more than the fact that you're just going to have to apply in order to get, to get a tag and they yeah. still may allocate the same number. Like I haven't really looked at how that's going to pan out, but I still think yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be still very available for people to get it. But I think they're just going to make it so that you at least have to go through the process and they're, you know, making a effort to uh, curtail or, yeah. or, you know, control a little bit more. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, but, yeah. I, think, I mean, with the boom of hunters, right? Like you have to have some of that. Uh, I know, I've been out there two years, the last two years in a row, uh, over the counter, and I may have run into six different people. And with Jared, you cover some ground. Uh, oh, yeah. It's not a lot. But last year, uh, me and my fiance were just kind of hanging by ourselves uh, for Thanksgiving. You're like, you know, let's go to Colorado. We'll hunt last last week rifle out there. I must have saw 100, 150 people. I mean, it was insane. Yeah, We didn't see any rifle elk. There was... People yeah. driving all over with their vehicles, nobody walking anywhere. And uh, it was yeah. just, okay. so we went up to the very far corner of that unit and we just walked like, we walked like 20 something miles the first day and then it snowed like crazy. And yeah. I don't know, I think, I think rifle season is probably the one you got to regulate a little more because there's a lot more success and a lot more people. It seems like bow season's so, so long and it's so much harder. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, well, that, that, that's a bummer. And And I think to your point, like, that also has a big bearing on why I don't rifle hunt as much in Colorado because like yeah. the last few years that I rifle hunt and I'm like, holy crap, this, this seems like the wild West. Like dudes are freaking right. throwing lead everywhere. And like yeah. part of, part of me was like, man, I, I just don't, I don't trust people. And no. you know, you get someone who comes from 1200, 1500 miles away that spent eight, seven to $800 on a tag, not to mention everything else. Like right. just the, the safety and some of that stuff. Like I just got to where like, I didn't feel that safe. And yeah, yeah you'd go, you'd go through a basin and like, you know, you start glassing and you're like orange, 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 orange. And I'm like, man, what are we doing yeah. here? And so yeah, I agree. Not good. Um, and I think that's what kind of soured me a little bit on it because of that. And, you know, yeah. bow hunting, I'm like, you know what? My odds aren't maybe as good, but I feel a heck of a lot safer. And I know I don't hear bullets whizzing by me all over the place like I do. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, we uh, we do have a couple points each. So hopefully we'll get to go out next year. Maybe we can re redo uh, our yeah. plan in 2025 here with Jared and Noah. And hopefully, hopefully that shakes out. We'll, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Love so. it. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate your time. I know you've got an, a meeting coming up here in a little bit, and so I don't want to carve into that, but um, it was awesome to get to talk to you. I definitely want to continue following up, and, and 100%, we, we got to make a hunt happen, whether it's out here or somewhere yeah. else. And so uh, appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. And, and it's it fun. It's fun to get to pick your brain a little bit. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, man. Always happy to come. It's funny because my old lady, she has she has an elk, a buffalo, a dad, an antelope. So I got to get an elk on the wall before she fills all the walls up. <laughs> so if there's, if there's ever a chance we can get together and try to chase some elk, man, let's hey, do it because I got yeah. I got to get some wall space at the I house. Like it. Well, well, we'll make it happen. You, you, let, you let us know, and I know Jared and I don't need a lot of excuse to get out. So... Uh, so, love, love to do it, man. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Man. Well, Joe, I really appreciate you having me on, dude. It was a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. And, uh... Thanks.